this morning to revert to two issues at two o'clock, and if I can deal with those two issues briefly before resuming my submission. Firstly, um, as the question of abandonment, um, I've had a look, as I said I would, at Mr. Justice Sheen's decision in the Lusitania. I'm not sure that takes the point that my Lord had in mind um, any further. Um, our, our position is that we rest our case on what is set out in paragraph 16 of the Common Ground, Supplementary Bundle, Tab 1, page 3, which was that the government of the Union was the lawful owner of the cargo, the silver at the time Talal was sunk, and remained the lawful owner of the silver at all times until the government of the Republic, as successor, became the lawful owner of the silver. So either my clients or the Union government before them were the lawful owner of the cargo at all times. They may have abandoned it in the lay sense of didn't actually harbour any hope of recovering it, certainly till 2016, 2017. But they had not abandoned it in any sense that affected their title to the property. It doesn't really answer my question about use or intended use being by whom? Well, my, my Lord, the answer to that is that in 1942, any questions of use or intended use, and I'll come on to this in a moment in my submissions on, on other matters, were spent for the reasons I mentioned this morning, i.e. that all the obligations under the two contracts had been performed, insofar as there was a use um, that, that was um, uh, history, as it were, by the time the, the vessel was lost and the cargo was sunk, and the intended use was an intended use before the cargo was well, I understand all that, but what I'm asking is, in 2017, when a salvor goes down and takes possession of the vessel, they have a possessory lien, is that right? Maritime lien. And they have, they have, they're, they're entitled to exclusive possession of the wreck. They have a possessory lien um, of... The um, wreck. Uh, um, certainly the cargo, for present purposes. So, may, so may why, why, is the, why is the usage by the Salvor totally irrelevant when the statute doesn't say it's totally irrelevant? I mean, I'm only really asking, Mr. Smith, you know this is not my field as well as I do. That's why it's sometimes quite useful to have judges who know absolutely nothing about a particular field. Well, my Lord, insofar as the use is concerned in 2017, um, and it, it may go actually back a, a year prior to that might be a, a matter that required a further evidential inquiry because it was not an issue before the judge. Because one would have to look at when my clients first became aware of the cargo. No, I think and you're misunderstanding my, my question. My, my question is simply, in section 10, which we are construing, it does not say use or intended use by the owner and only the owner. It says you saw intended use for commercial purposes. Right. Now, in theory, the use could be by somebody other than the owner. And I'm giving the example of a salvor or somebody else who comes into possession of the goods. Because possessors use goods customarily. Owners often don't. If I own a property and let it to you, Mr. Smith, and you uh, live in it, you use the property, I don't, right? Now, so all I'm saying is, why does the statute have to be construed as looking at only use by the owner? Because we all are agreed that 2017 is the relevant date to ask the question, because the statute says so. Um, my Lord, um, because the purpose of the inquiry is to ascertain whether the sovereign state, i.e. the putative defendant, mm -hmm. has lost its immunity mm -hmm. by virtue of the sovereign state having engaged in commerce. And therefore, because the section is intended to enact the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity, you are looking at the use or intended use of the sovereign, because you are colouring whether the sovereign has done an act, okay. a commercial act, so as to deprive it of the immunity it would otherwise well, be Where's under. the authority for that proposition? I mean, I, I quite understand it. It seems a very sensible argument. Where's the 
Is there any authority for that? Anyway, you think about it over now. My Lord, the, the authorities would be the passages from the Premier Congresso that I took the court to at the very beginning of my submissions, where we were looking at whether there was something in the nature of the acts by the state that justified the conclusion that it should not be immune. So I took my Lord and, um, to, an, uh, yeah. to the, the Premier Congresso. So that, I would say, it was sufficient orthodoxy okay. for the proposition that we are looking at the nature of the act. <coughs> the other point um, I was asked to look at is whether there was any English orthodoxy making the point in the Empire of Iraq case, uh, Empire of Iran case, um, that we looked at this morning. And the answer is no, and indeed, we've been unable to find anything specifically says that, even in what Lord Sumption said in Ben Bush. But we don't shirk from that being the answer, because it is actually the natural answer that follows from the analysis. Um, and the analysis in our submission is this. Customary international law develops as a result of state practice. So as and when there becomes a sufficiently established state practice, such as that for the restricted theory, then that becomes part of customary international law and binds the court. But unless and until there is established state practice, there is no customary international law. And therefore, by definition, it is still left to national courts to look at that question. So in our case, the restrictive theory, everybody agrees, has become part of customary international law. It is reflected in our act and the other acts that are in the bundles, some of which we've looked at. But there is no consensus beyond the restrictive theory. Therefore, there is no customary international law beyond the restrictive theory. Therefore, it must follow that a national court must apply national law unless and until there is a sufficiently developed consensus of customary international law. So we say that is why there is no authority that says it as a matter of English law, because it's the absence of customary international law that drives the point. And indeed, um, we had understood, uh, as we say in our appellant's notice, that it was uh, common ground before the judge and therefore going to be common ground before this court, that it was a matter for national courts to decide where to draw, the line, or national legislatures to decide um, where to draw the line. And um, in countries where there is no legislation, presumably that would fall to national courts. Um, and we put in before my lords the legislation in such states as we have been able to identify. So uh, I hope that has dealt with the two points I promised to come back to. I was at ground one of our ground of appeal. And I was about to take uh, the court to the judgment of the Supreme Court, Lord Clark, in uh, Savas, if I could ask that we turn that up, dealing with the issue of whether it was appropriate for the judge to have regard to the contract for sale and the contract for carriage when determining whether the cargo was in use. Um, Savas is at tab 15 of the authorities bundle beginning at page 323. <coughs> um, briefly, to recount the facts insofar as they're relevant, the claimant sought to enforce a debt owed by the defendant bank to Iraq as part of a scheme of arrangement. The debt was made up of commercial claims against the bank, which had been admitted as part of a scheme of arrangement and are referred to in the judgment as the admitted claims. Um, it was common ground that the money payable to Iraq was property for the purposes of Section 13.2b. So this was an enforcement claim. And the underlying claims against the bank had been assigned to Iraq. The transactions which gave rise to the underlying claims were all commercial transactions between the bank and the assignors. The claimant also argued, although the court didn't decide either at first instance court of appeal or in the Supreme Court level, 
Uh, but the claimant argued that the transactions by which Iraq purchased the admitted claims were also commercial transactions, but that didn't form part of the decision. But the claimant did argue that the admitted claims were in use to secure payment by Iraq of the monies due under the scheme of arrangement, and that that made the purpose of the property, of the money in the accounts, or of the debt due, rather, um, commercial. And we can see that from paragraph 12 of uh, Lord Clark's judgment at page 333. Uh, this is Lord Clark's summary of the claimant's case. In essence, the case for Sabat is that the nature of the transaction which gave rise to Radifan, that's the bank, Radifan's liability was entirely commercial. The admitted claims and the right to a dividend contribution are properly described as in use in order to either obtain payment or to complete the underlying commercial transaction giving rise to the claim, or alternatively as part of the transaction pursuant to which Iraq acquired the admitted claims, the nature of which was not a sovereign act. So that was the claimant's case. Um, at first instance, uh, Mr Justice Arnold, as he then was, uh, rejected the claim to immunity, and on appeal, the Court of Appeal also rejected uh, the claim to immunity. You can see the summary um, of the judgment of uh, Lord Justice Stanley Burton at paragraph 14 on page 234, uh, where Lord Clark summarises his approach as follows. Um, as Lord Justice Stanley Burton put it, the fact that the property, here a debt, arises from a commercial transaction does not inform the question whether the property was at the relevant time used for a commercial purpose. So we say the fact that the cargo arises from a commercial transaction, the sale contract to the union, does not inform, inform, let alone, we say, answer the question whether the property was at the relevant time used for a commercial purpose. Um, and then at paragraph 15, as I see it, the central question in this appeal is whether the nature or origin of the debts is relevant to the question of whether the property in question was in use for commercial purposes. Going over the page to paragraph 16, that's the language of section 13.4, I would accept Mr. Harrison's counsel's submission on behalf of Iraq that the expression in use for commercial purposes should be given its ordinary and natural meaning having regard to its context. I would further accept his submission that it would not be an ordinary use of the language to say that a debt arising from a transaction is in use for that transaction. Parliament did not intend a retrospective analysis of all the circumstances which gave rise to the property, but an assessment of the use to which the state has chosen to put the property. So assessed as at 1942, the method by which the Union government had acquired the silver does not give the answer to whether it is in use. The use which the state has chosen to put the property answers that question. That use had not commenced at the time that the ship was sunk with the cargo. That use, the intention for that use, had been formed. The very purpose of purchasing the silver was to mint coin. Uh, and then at paragraph uh, 17, the language of section 13.4 is to be contrasted with other parts of the Act. It is, for example, to be contrasted with section 3.1, which refers to proceedings relating to a commercial transaction. So again, the contrast where you have an actual transaction is that your claim can relate to that transaction. Here, the claim in salvage does not relate to either of the contracts that the learned judge concluded coloured the question of whether the cargo was commercial or not. And section 10, which refers to claims in connection with a ship, in enacting section 13.4, Parliament could have referred to property that related to a commercial transaction or arose in connection with a commercial transaction as being susceptible to enforcement. Um, it chose not to do so, which suggests an intention that it intended a different meaning. Property will only be subject to enforcement where it can be established that it is currently in use or intended for use for a commercial transaction. It is not sufficient that property relates to or is connected with a commercial transaction. I would accept Mr. Howard's submission that this is consistent with the different treatment of the two categories of immunity in the Act. So that is between enforcement and adjudicative. And we say, as I've said this morning, the use of exactly the same words in section 10.4a suggests that the correct meaning is the same as in section 13, not as in section 
Great. Um, another way of putting it, where, uh, which we pick up in paragraph 25 of Lord Clark's judgment, where he refers to a, a judgment of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in the United States, where he quotes Judge Garza in a, a case that involved money owed to the Congo. Um, and uh, opposite letter E at page 338. To use property for a commercial activity within the ordinary meaning of use would be to put the property in the service of the commercial activity, to carry out the activity by means of the property. And again, in our context, um, we are not, nobody has, put the cargo to the, in service of the commercial activity or carried out the activity, i.e. the sale contract or the carriage contract, by means of the property. The sale contract um, is a sale contract and the carriage contract is being carried out by means of the ship. Uh, and um, <coughs> in our submission, that guidance is directly applicable question which the court has to ask itself in this case in the context of section 10 4 a is the cargo or was it in 1942 insofar as that is relevant in use or intended for use in a commercial purpose and the answer is no it was not being used for the purpose of either of the commercial contracts which the learned judge identified So uh, we say that applying um, the guidance of, of the Supreme Court, um, the learned judge was wrong to have regard either to the FOB sale contract or the contract for carriage, because they both form part of the history which gave rise to <coughs> the Union government owning the property, and they don't, don't tell as to the use of that property. It would not be in the ordinary use of language to say that property arising for a transaction is in use for the purposes of that transaction. Uh, in our submission, the contract of carriage and the contract of sale, all the more so, are even further removed than the commercial lease and the commercial contract for the visa services in LR Avionics Wad, which is the case we looked at uh, shortly before the luncheon adjournment. The silver is remotely connected with the contract of carriage, but that does not make it in use for the purposes of In that respect, we would respectfully point out that um, even those authors of academic articles since the first instance judgment who believe the judge got to the right answer agree with us that his meaning attributed to the words in use is difficult to reconcile with the ordinary and natural meaning of those words. We looked this morning at Hepburn and Walpole at tab 35 and at page uh, 634, they in the same terms, it is submitted that the court's conclusions are difficult to reconcile with the ordinary and natural meaning of the statutory terms, even when taking a purposive approach to statutory interpretation. We commend those words to my laws and my lady. And, and that is expressly because um, the uh, learned judge um, was uncomfortable with the suggestion that a cargo could be not in use at any particular time. Whereas, as I've submitted this morning, it is recognised both by the Australian Act and by the ILC that cargo is not normally in use when it is on board. And obviously I accept that gives rise to the point my lady raised with me before the luncheon adjournment, but we do say that nonetheless that is the correct submission. Well, you've grasped that particular nettle very firmly. I've got it to my lady. Um, so, um, uh, applying alternatively the test um, set out in um, Alcom, which we looked at this morning, the silver had not been earmarked in any way for use in commercial uh, purposes. Insofar as it had been earmarked, uh, to use the phrase from Alcom, it had been earmarked for use in the um, San African Minute. And there are then the three cases that the court has in the bundle 
concerning enforcement against debts and bank accounts. So we've looked at Savas. But Alcon, um, that was a case, we have that at divider 10, page 212. Alcon was an action to enforce a default judgment by way of a garnishee order, as it was then referred to, over funds held in a bank account. Um, the, the court held that the, um, forgive me, my lord, the shows in action was property. The right to be paid for money in the bank account was property, so as to engage section 13.2. But under section 13.2, it was immune unless 13.4 was engaged. Unless the creditor could show that the bank account was designated as being drawn upon to meet liabilities, section 13.4 could not apply. And uh, relevantly, if we pick up at page 235 to 236 of the bundle, uh, 235, my lord, the decisive question for your lordship is whether in the context of the other provisions of the Act to which I have referred, and against the background of its subject matter, public international law, the words property which is for the time being in use or intended for use for commercial purposes, appearing as an exception to the general immunity to enforcement jurisdiction of the United Kingdom, courts accorded by section 13.2 to the property of a foreign state, are apt to describe the debts represented by a balance standing to the credit of a current account kept with a commercial banker for the purposes of meeting the expenditure incurred in the day-to-day -day running of the diplomatic mission of a foreign state. And then further down at letter D, unless it can be shown by the judgment creditor who is seeking to attach the credit balance by garnishing proceedings that the bank account was earmarked by the foreign state solely, save for de minimis exceptions, for being drawn upon to settle liabilities incurred in commercial transactions, as for example by issuing documentary credits in payment of the price of goods sold to the state, I cannot, in my, it cannot, in my view, be sensibly brought within the crucial words of the exception. So the person, party bringing the claim must establish that, the, in this case, the debt um, has been earmarked for solely commercial purposes. Um, our, our case is the contrary of that when we are looking at 1942. The property in question had been earmarked for substantially um, sovereign purposes. Solely is putting it higher than Parliament Belt, isn't it? Uh, I, th I think, say, yes. Substantially. Um, yes. I mean, it may well be that Lord Diplock and his de, de minimis had it in mind, to, but uh, it does seem to me that there is a slight conflict between the two approaches. It may not matter for present purposes. My, my lady, solely, yes, it go, goes further. Solely than, goes further. Further than Parliament Belge. Um, uh, uh, but um, save for de minimis exceptions, possibly tracks back a little bit. But um, I've set out our submissions yeah. that substantially, as in Parliament Belge, is the correct test, as the judge would have applied if he had not been against me on use. And of course, you can you can understand why Lord Diplock says what he did does, because um, otherwise you'd be delving into the minutiae of, you know, eighty percent of the amounts of the money go out to uh, pay um, goods and services, and twenty percent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It becomes a very very difficult exercise. My my lady, not only does it become difficult. But in our submission, the very act of going into that kind of inquiry conflicts with mm. the grant of immunity to the state in the yeah. first place. Because yeah. if the state is immune, the national court should not be going into that kind of inquiry. Um, and so, uh, but as I say, I've set out my case based on Parliament Belgium substantially. Yeah. And so the next case I, I wanted to turn to in relation to this point is the AIC decision of, of Mr. Justice Stan Burton. Um, at first instance, where I was no um, and, and um, <coughs> he says at paragraph 56, you'll do this at paragraph 56. Tab 12, is it? Sorry, tab 12, page 278. So AIC was an action by the claimant to enforce a Nigerian judgment, which had been registered in this jurisdiction. Uh, and that enforcement by was by way of a third-party debt order in relation to accounts held by the government of the Nigerian Central Bank. 
And the main issue in the case was whether the state was immune from the action to register the judgment in the first place. Uh, and uh, the learned judge held that it was. And so the rest of the judgment is, strictly speaking, expositor. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, Mr. Justice Stanley Burton ruled that bank accounts were, in any event, um, immune. And the, the application raises 16 bank accounts. They had all been dormant with no payments made from them for at least um, 18 months. We see that from paragraph 55 at page 278. And what the learned judge went on to say is this. Um, the use or intended use of property may change over time. So where, where is this? Paragraph 56 on page 278. The use or intended use of property may change over time. In the case of a bank account, the onus is on the judgment creditor to show that use or intended use of the account is, apart from minimal exceptions, for commercial purposes within the meaning of the Act. So again, my lady, a slightly different phraseology mm. there. Lord Diplock in Alcombe, page 604, D to E. Evidence of recent use in an account, wholly for commercial purposes, over a significant period of time, may lead to the conclusion that the account is used or intended to be used for wholly commercial purposes. But the older the use has to evidence, the weaker the inference that may be drawn as to the use or intended use of the account. Now, I, I won't come back to it, but we will rely on that later in relation to the extent to which 1942 is relevant at all. Uh, because, of course, the use of a property can change, even if there was some element of commercial use in 1942 because of the sale contract and the contract of carriage. That was all very long ago, past history, by 2017, which is the date that the court has to look at. But for present purposes, I take the court to AIC simply to reinforce the submission based on the past that different forms of property can give rise to different considerations about use or intended use. And the court has to apply the, um, the ordinary meaning of the words in the context in which they are used. That is to say, the decision as to whether the state is or is not entitled to invoke immunity. So um, that was AIC. And I should refer, um, because it's, it's the case against me, as it were, also to the Oroscom case, where the decision of the court was the other way. So Oroscom is at tab 40, page 305. And Oroscom was a case to enforce, um, a claim to enforce an arbitral award by way of a third party debt order over an account which was referred to as the borrower's account. Uh, the borrower's account had been set up specifically as part of a scheme, as part of an arrangement with the World Bank to provide finance to build an oil pipeline across Chad and Cameroon. And the scheme that was set up required all the proceeds of sale from the oil from the pipeline to be paid into an escrow account in London. The gross revenue went into an account which was called the transit account. And amounts required to service the debt were then transferred into a debt services account. 10% was then put into a separate fund called the Future Generations Fund. And the balance was transferred to the borrower's account. Um, held um, by Mr. Justice Burton that in those circumstances, the borrower's account was in use for commercial purposes, principally because it was being used to receive the proceeds of the commercial activity of carrying oil through the pipeline. Such part of those proceeds as were going to be used for what could be called sovereign purposes were separately transferred into the future generations fund that I already referred to. And the balance was held in the borrower's account as part of the payment mechanism required by the World Bank as a term of its provision of financing to Chad for the commercial purpose of operating the pipeline. So moving um, to um, paragraph 18 of the judgment. Which is at paragraph at page 313. Mr. Landau, who was for the creditor, um, submits that as to um, one in 16 above, that's one of the arguments advanced by Chad, Alcon is of no relevance. The conclusion of the House of Lords was that the use of, for diplomatic purposes was not for commercial purposes. 
As to two in paragraph 16, it's quite clear from the evidence referred to in paragraphs 8 and 9 above that the only money which could be said to be admixed, namely the 10% of oil revenues which were to be set aside and invested for future use by way of the future generation fund, had already been separated. So this is the point I made, that any money that was potentially regarded as sovereign had been separated into a separate account. The fund for future generations has remained, as set out above, with Citibank proper, while the funds in the borrower's account are quite separate from the future generations fund and are invested in the CILF account number 4723, which is the only account now in issue. Um, the original application had been for orders in relation to all of the accounts, but by the time it came to court, it was only in respect of the borrower's account. And then at paragraph 20, um, on page 305, the monies are not the London assets of the National Fund of Chad, and are not being operated or traded in London pursuant to global custody or any other agreement with Chad and Citibank. The monies are in London because they're required to be channeled through the mechanisms expressly set up by the RPM in order to preserve them so that Chad's direct oil revenues pursuant to the oil contracts were not simply passed direct to Chad. So this is all part of the commercial purpose of the whole scheme that is set up. And then in conclusion at paragraph 23, later on in that page, I'm entirely satisfied that this account, the borrower's account, was established by the RPM and has been operated specifically for the purposes of a commercial transaction. Namely, one, so as to receive the proceeds of a contract to supply of goods and services, that's the proceeds of the, carry of the transportation of oil through the pipeline, and two, so as to be part of a system specifically established for the purposes of repayment of the loans by the World Bank, etc., to Chad. So there are two specific commercial purposes, and any money which could be said to be sovereign is in a different fund and not affected by the application. So that is the other side of the same coin which we say Corp can derive from Alcom and from AIC, which is the inquiry as to the use or intended use of the proceeds. So, uh, to summarise this section of our submission, the cargo in 1942 was not in use, taking the ordinary meaning of those words, for the purposes of either the FOB sale contract or the contract for carriage. It was not intended for use for the purpose of either of those um, transactions. The learned judge was wrong with respect to the <coughs> that a cargo purchased on FOB terms and carriage pursuant to the contract for carriage was in use for commercial purposes. And insofar as Mr. Justice Gross reached a similar conclusion in the Altair, uh, which I accept that he did, A, that was obiter, and B, with respect, it was wrong for the same reasons we advanced in relation to the judge's decision. I would also note that it's clear from the report of the Altair case that Alcom was not cited for Mr. Justice Gross, as he then was, nor was AIC, and obviously he did not have the benefit of the judgment in Savas because that came after <coughs> his decision. Why does this reasoning not apply equally to CIF contracts? If the state was buying it pursuant to us, sorry, his reasoning, his reasoning would be equally wrong in relation to a CIF. Yeah, I mean, why does your reasoning, your argument, in your skeleton, you say it's different. Um, if, if the state is a seller pursuant to a CIF contract, is the example we give. Yeah. And the reason why that is arguably different is that if the seller is selling pursuant to a CIF contract, then the cargo could be said to be in use for the purposes of the CIF contract because it needs to be carried because the carriage of the cargo forms part of the obligation under the CIF contract. I don't understand that. A CIF seller. Suppose, so far as the dealing physically with the goods are concerned, the CIF seller has discharged all his obligations once he's put it on board. Yeah. Yes, there are there's the obligation to procure the contract of carriage. He's done that by then, and to tender conforming documents. The risk will have passed on shipment. He may not. He may retain his property. But so far as what the cargo itself is being used for the physical cargo that is not being used for, for anything after it's been put on board in the sense of used to fulfil the contract, is it? My Lord, yes. We only put that forward as a possible example of where it might be argued that 
Well, you, I, I, you put it forward because you were trying to give some content to the word use uh, in relation to cargo um, uh, in, in, in 10.4a. In, 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 indeed. Right. Uh, it's it's not impossible to conceive of a of a contractual e example where the state is the seller, um, but the state does not fulfil its obligations of delivery until the cargo reaches the other end of its journey. It's very unlikely because most contracts would work in the same way as my lord has postulated, whether they're F FOB or, or CIF. But um, one could have a bespoke contract, I suppose, where the state is the seller, and in order to fulfil its contractual obligations under the contract of transport and sale, um, it, it requires the state to um, rec to procure that they are carried. But um, speaking for myself, I can't at the moment see any distinction between a civil or a POV contract for the purposes that we are concerned with. <coughs> it may well be that if you had a, a sale on delivered terms, as it were, delivered at, at discharge port, mm. Uh, you would say that the cargo was intended for use for the contract because you only fulfilled the contract by delivery at that stage. But it's no, no constat that it, during the course of the voyage it is actually in use. But there we are. Mm -hmm. well, that that may, may be a better analysis of the example, as would my ladies, if there were a contract where the, the vendor was obliged to bring the cargo to destination. So in, in that respect, I'm more than happy to accept that it was not a particularly good example because it was only intended to illustrate that it is at least notionally possible that a cargo might, might be in use. If it was a bad example of that, then I, I'm happy to withdraw the, the bad example. Um, but that doesn't undermine the point that, as my lady has said, I've already engaged with, that it doesn't matter whether the cargo is actually in use or not during the, the course of the voyage. Well, your, your case really is that sub, sub, su subject to truly exceptional situations where it might be argued that it's in use by the state, for ballast purposes or something of that nature, it will never be in use because it's just passive. It's on, a, on the ship, it's being taken from A to B, and it's not being used by anybody for any particular purpose. You say that doesn't matter. It doesn't do violence to the language of the statute because um, when it comes to the statute, you look at the actual use of the ship and the intended use of the cargo. In, in, indeed, my lady, and that's mm. the point. And that's the simple point, that's really. The simple point. It's either right or it's wrong. Um, my, my lady, yes, in, in many ways it is that simple. And, and with respect, both the learned judge and Mr. Justice Gross, um, to use the, the phraseology of Mr. Justice Arnold at the first instance, Mr. Gross, wrongly conflated the transactions by which the government acquired the silver with the intended use of the silver. Mm. And that is essentially the, the mistake that we submit they made. And that's quoted by Lord Clark at paragraph 13 of the judge, uh, and again, uh, uh, of his judgment, and again, where he looked at Lord Justice Ricks, who was in the minority in the Court of Appeal in Sivas. He said that Lord Justice Ricks had wrongly elided the historical origin of the silver with the current and future use of the silver. And again, that is the mistake with respect that the, the learned judge and Mr. Justice Gross made um, in the Elm Fair. So those are our submissions in, in relation to ground one. Um, although, in strict speaking, on ground three, we say ground one doesn't even apply, um, it's important to deal with them because they are the simple point. And if we're right on that, as my lady has said, that is, uh, we would respectfully submit an end of the matter. Moving on to ground two, um, having observed at paragraph 159 of the judgment that at present um, all that is sought from the court is that it exercises adjudicative jurisdiction to, man, to, to determine the amount of salvage that is due, the judge erred in concluding that there was no principled reason for state immunity from the court's adjudicative jurisdiction in an action in REM claiming salvage where the state had chosen to have its cargo carried by sea pursuant to the contract of carriage. So this was the judge developing his, uh, his, his, the weight he attached to the contract of carriage. And essentially what he was saying is if you choose to have your cargo carried by sea, you expose yourself to a risk of having to um, pay for salvage services, and there is nothing unfair about you not being held in, uh, entitled to immunity in relation to that. And the first point we would make is this, that the the fact that the court is only being asked to exercise its adjudicative jurisdiction is in our submission irrelevant in circumstances where we say we are immune from that adjudicative jurisdiction. Leading on from that, the principled reason why we are entitled to immunity, the judge posed the question, what is the principled reason, is the same principled reason we submit that applies to all claims to immunity from adjudicative and enforcement 
um, and, and therefore hybrid um, jurisdiction. Firstly, to allow the claim to proceed against an asset of the state is, we would suggest, an interference with its sovereign function, which is the test suggested by Lord Wilberforce in the Premier Congresso case, um, which we looked at earlier. And that is because um, the in rem sorry, proceedings against the cargo necessarily interfere with the state's um, ability to deal with its assets. I appreciate the point my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell made this morning, so that doesn't necessarily follow, but in our submission, if the property is actually in use for commercial purposes and actually intended to be used for those purposes, there isn't any interference because the state has gone down into the marketplace. But absent that, this is still sovereign property. And if the state does not at least take part in the proceeding against the cargo, it takes the risk that the cargo will be lost to it because the proceedings will proceed to judgment adjudicatively and then assuming the claimant wants to enforce its claim to enforcement. And therefore, it does interfere with the state's right to deal with its property as it sees fit, even to allow adjudicative proceedings in REM. Uh, but further, even um, where there is not as yet an application for arrest or sale of the rigs of the cargo, which would engage Section 13, the uh, test uh, for an action in REM is, as I've already said, the same test under the Act as for the enforcement. More fundamentally, um, we submit that in the context of a claim against the cargo, the judge simply attached too much weight to the distinction between adjudicative and enforcement proceedings for the reasons that I've already submitted this morning and I'm not going to go back to. In particular, as Lord Ditlock observed in Alcombe, the jurisdiction in REM is a hybrid uh, jurisdiction and will necessarily interfere with the state's ability to deal with its property. But the way we can test the submission is as follows. If the judge's approach was correct, there would, we would suggest, be no need for the reference to in use or intended for use in section 10.4a at all. A claim for salvage is, um, apart from the other examples I gave this morning of forfeiture, condemnation, and dwarfs of admiralty, Claim for salvage is the only um, real claim, well, it's the only claim in which um, there would be a claim for immunity um, under Section 13.2a, which can be made against the cargo. So it's the only claim against the cargo. If exposing your cargo to the risk of requiring salvage services was sufficient to mean that it was a commercial cargo, then all state owned cargoes that were on board a ship would be commercial because any cargo on board is at risk of needing salvage services. Particularly one might say any cargo on board at wartime, at risk of enemy action, um, as Talal was, is at risk of being lost through the enemy action. But even not in wartime, any cargo on board a ship is at risk of needing uh, salvage services. So if one takes the judge's approach with respect, it proves too much. Because if exposing your cargo to the risk of needing salvage services means that you should be treated as being a commercial cargo owner for the purpose of the Act, then all cargoes would be commercial. If that were Parliament's intention, Section 10.4a would just say an action in REM against a cargo belonging to that state. As I said, it would not need to refer to purposes at all. Well, isn't that taking what the judge said a little, too, a little further than what he actually meant? Because he's linking it with a commercial contract for transportation. So I don't think even the, on the judge's analysis he would accept that if the cargo was on board a, a ship that was requisitioned during wartime um, to carry, say, armaments to the place of war, that you would be exposing yourself to the risk of a salvage action and therefore depriving yourself of sovereign immunity. It's the commercial nature of the deal that causes it to be put on board the ship in the first place that he's con concentrating on, rightly or wrongly. You say it's irrelevant because that's history. Um, he says it's part of the overall picture that you've you've contracted for a, a commercial <coughs> venture um, by putting your, your ship on the high seas pursuant to a commercial contract for which um, some sort of payment or reward is made. The, um, um, the, the paragraph I, I, I was dealing with 
in the Learned Judge's Judgment. It's paragraph 161, uh, yeah. my lady. Yeah. And it's right, he does have that, the distinction my lady has mentioned in mind. Uh, I therefore have difficulty in accepting that there's a principled reason for state immunity from courts adjudicative jurisdiction in an action in REM claims salvage, mm -hmm. where the state has chosen to have its cargo carried by sea pursuant to a contract for carriage, exactly. just like any private owner of cargo. But the, the words I had in mind, my lady, were the next words, and has therefore exposed itself to claims for salvage. Well, the key like, word is therefore. Therefore, I indeed. But, my lady, the point we, we would submit still holds good, because if that is a rationale for holding that the state should not be immune, that the state has exposed itself to a potential claim for cargo, shipping a cargo in the circumstances my lady has postulated equally exposes that cargo to a risk of needing salvage services. Well, yes, but there's not a, there's not a co commercial contract behind it. There is a requisition, which is a different thing. You can't just sort of read half of the sentence and, and leave the other half out. What the judge is basically saying is, um, let's suppose that you've got a private owner who puts his goods on board a ship, um, uh, and they're going from A to B. Uh, the intended use of that cargo when it gets to B is neither here nor there. When it comes to the adjudicative jurisdiction in relation to salvage. Um, you could bring an action against the ship or against the cargo or both, and there wouldn't be a problem. Why, therefore, should it be any different if the person who puts the goods on board the ship versus uh, uh, under a, um, a commercial contract happens to be a state? Why should the fact that, uh, coincidentally, the cargo is destined to ultimately to be used for a sovereign purpose make any difference to it exposing itself to the risk of an action um, against the ship or the cargo. That, that's the point he's making. Now, it may be a bad point, but speaking for myself, I don't actually see that the answer to it that you provided is an answer. Well, m my lady, um, perhaps I can deal with this way. There are a number of other possible permutations. Hmm. Um, take, for example, a cargo that is undoubtedly intended for um, sovereign purposes, say humanitarian cargo, which is what Mr. Justice Gross was referring to in, in the odd tale, but is shipped on commercial terms. Mm. Um, on, on the judge's reasoning, even that cargo is going to be liable to the claim against the cargo because it is commercial, mm. even though it is undoubtedly a humanitarian cargo, which we would say, applying the restrictive theory that only requires you to deprive the state of immunity when it's engaged in the commercial activity, providing a humanitarian cargo ought to be one of those activities for which immunity um, did exist. Test the matter the other way round. If a cargo was completely gratuitous, so um, donated to the um, state, carried on board um, either a state vessel for free or a merchant vessel for free if it was an aid cargo, and put oneself in the position of the salvor, why should the salvor be in a <coughs> worse position for providing services to that cargo than to any other cargo, or put that question because the there's way. no commercial element to the transaction whatsoever on that hypothesis. In, in, indeed, my lady, but that does not affect the effort or the time or the expenditure that the salvor must go to. No, but we we already have as a background that there is a difference between sovereign immunity um, for um, acts that have a, a sovereign function and acts that have a commercial function. In that example, there's no commercial function whatsoever, and therefore um, sal the salvor acts at his own peril without a contract. Uh, my lady, yes. Not the best example, Mr. Smith. Well, apart from the fact that the salvor um, has does not necessarily have any way of knowing the status of the cargo that they are going to sell. But, my, my lady, the, the point, um, I, I, I see the point. But our submission nonetheless remains that in giving weight to um, the commercial nature of the sales contract and yeah. the um, contract carriage, the judge erred. And if his approach was correct, there would be no need for Article 25 of the Salvage Convention to be worded the way it is, because if exposing your risk, your cargo to the risk um, of salvage um, justified the conclusion that it was a commercial cargo, um, then um, Article 25 would not need to refer to in use or commercial use, um, commercial purposes. It would simply say state-owned cargoes are immune. Um, the other um, reason why, just to complete the submissions on this, this uh, one of our grounds, um, the judge's uh, approaches with threat wrong can be seen from Section 10, Subsection 3 of the Act, 
which is the sister city um, jurisdiction. And section 10, subsection 3, says that when a claim, this is just for claims against ships, not cargo. When a claim in REM is brought against the ship belonging to a state for enforcing a claim in connection with another ship, subsection 2A above does not apply as respects the first mentioned ship, uh, when, um, where, at the time the cause of action arose, sorry, I skipped on one, as against the first mentioned ship, unless at the time when the cause of action um, relating to the other ship arose, both ships were intended for use, in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. So it is not only the ship in respect of which the claim arises, so in this case, my lady, the ship carrying the cargo, to invoke the in rem jurisdiction, even adjudicative in rem jurisdiction, you would have to show that the ship against which you are going to bring your claim in rem, the sister ship, is in use for commercial purposes. And that, in some senses, comes back to my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell's point this morning about whether adjudicative proceedings really do affect the sovereignty of the state. Section 10.3 suggests that the draftsman considers they do because he is protecting the sister ship as well as the ship in relation to which the claim arises. But the sister, I, I can't see how that gets you anywhere because um, the, the right to arrest a sister ship is an extended right. So you would normally have the right to arrest the ship on which the goods are carried. And in order to be able to arrest a sister ship, which belongs to a sovereign state, on the face of it, it's immune from arrest, you've got to come up with some reason why, which justifies an extension of the um, adjudicative jurisdiction. And the answer is it's got to be in commercial use as well. But I don't see how that gets you any further down the line, with respect, on, in relation to the cargo. Um, because, my lady, it illustrates um, Obviously, this is only in relation to the ship. Hmm. But if the commercial use of the vessel to which the claim relates were sufficient to justify removing immunity in REM, you would not have to have added to that a requirement that the sister ship was also in commercial use. The sister ship, even more so than the, the ship subject of the claim, is only the subject of adjudicative jurisdiction. Yet there is still a requirement that it should be in use or intended for use in commercial purposes. Because it has nothing to do with the transaction in question, and it's an extension of the adjudicative <laughs> jurisdiction. So again, I, I can't see how arguing about an extended jurisdiction is going to help you on the scope of the primary jurisdiction. Well, my lady, the, the point will not become any better for repetition, so oh. I'm <laughs> Ground uh, three, uh, in our respectful submission, the judge erred in holding that it was appropriate to have regard to the status of the cargo in 1942, alternatively in attaching too much weight to its status in 1942. The wording of the Act um, is clear. The court needs to look at use or intended use at the time when the cause of action arose. The wording of Article 25, insofar as it matters, is also clear what is relevant is the time of the salvage services, which would be they conclude and the cause of action accrues. Um, it's common ground that that means 2017, um, October on um, the claimant's case, June in our case. But whichever was correct, the silver was not, as I've submitted this morning, in use. It was on board the so seabed worker or on board the Pacific Ascari, um, depending on who is correct as to when the cause of action accrued. We did not form any intention as to its use. Um, until after the date that the court is concerned with, um, at its earliest, the 13th of October, um, the judge's finding. Prior to that, to use Lord, Lord Ditlock's words, it had not been earmarked for any use. The reason for the court's inquiry as to use or intended to use is to ascertain whether the state has dealt with the cargo in a way that indicates that it's become a commercial rather than a non-commercial cargo. And that question can, we submit, be adequately answered by looking at what happened in 2017 without looking back to what happened in 1942. So at some stage between 1942 and 2017, had the South African government abandoned all uh, intention to use the uh, silver ingots for um, the purposes of smelting uh, new bullion? New, um, sorry, new... Um, coin. Coin. Um, 
my lady, there is no affirmative evidence either way, but I don't think I could seriously argue that anybody maintained that intention after the cargo was sunk, because nobody, it was not in anybody's expectation it could be recovered. So, but equally, um, had the South African, uh, the Union government, maintained any use of the cargo that was um, current in 1942, equally, um, no. So if, if, if the argument is what happened in 1942 ceased to be relevant, then we would agree, but so did um, the, the use, insofar as the judge held that being purchased pursuant to a commercial contract and carried pursuant to a commercial contract, was a use. So um, our submission um, is as follows. Firstly, one doesn't need to look at 1942. Um, if the union had actually been using the cargo for some affirmative purposes, and we all agree that that's highly unlikely, but if it had been, we could see that there would be some force in the argument that that use was relevant to 2017, the same way as the ship was in use for commercial purposes. And we accept that that colours the court's decision in relation to the use. But there was no actual use in 1942. At the most, there was use for the purposes of Section 10, as the judges looked at it. You have to say for the purposes of Section 10, the cargo was in use. But countervailing that, as, as my lady has just pointed out, is that in 1942 there was an actual intention. And we submit that, therefore, in terms of whether the cargo was a commercial cargo or a sovereign cargo, the actual use um, is more relevant. So um, taking it in steps when one is considering the position in 1942, as I said, firstly, there was no actual use in 1942. Secondly, as regards the FOB sale contract, this had been completed when the cargo was loaded on board and in any event, no later than when the purchase price was paid by the government to whoever had paid it um, by the government in uh, December 1942, 2nd of December. That contract was, we would submit, simply irrelevant as to the status of the cargo in uh, 2017. It was a fully performed contract and couldn't any longer be relevant to the status of the cargo. Thirdly, as regards the contract of carriage, the Carriage um, had been paid for by the Indian government in the first instance and had been reimbursed by the Union on the 2nd of December 1942, as we looked at this morning. That contract, too, was spent insofar as there were any obligations on the Union government in 1942, possibly or probably by operation of the doctrine of frustration once mm. the uh, ship was sunk. But in any event, we submit it's factually irrelevant to the status of the cargo in 2017. In relation to both the 1942 contracts, uh, we submit and invite the court to conclude that the position is analogous to the dormant bank account that Mr Justice Stanley Burton looked at in the AIC case, which I looked at um, earlier. I read you the relevant passage. I said I would be relying on it again later, and I don't propose uh, to read it again. Fourthly, if the carriage contract, if you are assessing the status of the cargo in 1942, if the commercial contracts are in any way relevant, the weight that one can attach to those commercial contracts, which are only the antecedent history to how the state became the owner of the cargo, are de minimis when put against the actual affirmative intention for future use. So in 1942, the Union intended to use the coin for silver for sovereign purposes, so the minting of coins. And so the history by which it acquired the silver becomes irrelevant when one knows the actual sovereign intention that the government had for the cargo. Uh, and we respectfully suggest that if the judge was going to look at 1942, he should have taken into account that actual intention that the government had at the time. <coughs> so, um, Mr Smith, is, is the ship in use or in intended use in, 19, in 2017? My Lord, because it was in actual commercial use in, 20, in 1942, we would accept that that colours its status still and justifies the conclusion that it's in use for the purposes of Section okay. 10. What is, what, what's, what is it being used? It, it, use of here means by the shipper. When we're talking about the ship. Yes. Okay, what, what, what was the ship only using? the wreck that had been at the bottom of the sea for 47 years and had no uh, value at all for in 2017. My Lord, if it is necessary for the purposes of section, I'm not dodging 
question is, if it is necessary for the purposes of Section 10 to identify either a use or intended use, one has to look back to the last use of the ship because there is no intended use and no use, and it's not a state-owned ship in this situation. What's the point of the timing provision? Well, my Lord, certainly at, in, in front of the judge, we um, did submit um, that the ship was not in use in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, I, I accepted, I think, in argument um, that um, there was force in the submission that it was in use, and I'm not going to resign well, from the position. Well, it's not a question of whether you're resigning from it or not. It's what is the basis for that concession? It seems completely ridiculous, if I may respectfully say so, to say that a ship that has lain at the bottom of the sea for 80 years is in use by a ship owner who no longer exists for commercial purposes in 2017. I mean, it, it informs the, the meaning of in use for commercial purposes of the cargo at the relevant time. So it's not a completely irrelevant question. And to make a concession that is obviously a beggar's belief is is a strange thing to have done. So do you do you say that there is a reason why it must be correct? And if so, what is it? Um, can I just con consider just for one moment, Your Honour, and that would require a motion. Um, reasoning behind accepting that for the purposes of section 10.4a the ship was in use for commercial purposes is that if one doesn't look back at the use that the ship was in in 1942 one is left that is neither in use nor intended for use. That would not be a problematic conclusion if one was looking at a state of the ship. And Sorry, I'm, you've got to speak up again. I apologise. One is one. left with a ship that is neither in use nor in intended use, then what? That would not, we uh, suggest, be a problem if we were talking about a state-owned ship, so we were talking about a claim against a state-owned ship, because we would say there's no third category, not in use, not intended for use, means the ship is still sovereign property. But we are concerned here with the carrying ship, which is not a state-owned ship. And so that residual category of that I've put forward for the cargo, which is state-owned, that you treat it as still state-owned for commercial purposes when it's neither in use or intended for use. That category doesn't exist when you're looking at the merchant ship. And so there has to be a meaning to the words in use or intended for use. Well, in, in 1942, the, the ship is in use uh, for the purposes of carrying the cargo, the steward's My contract mind. of carriage. That purpose no longer exists, and has long since ceased to exist. 2017. But you say it still had the same use in 2017. And if not, then what use did it have? And how do we interpret use in a way that can encompass both 
for the purposes of Section 10.4 to treat it as having the same use. Right. But why? Why? I mean, you're, you're, because you're, otherwise, the words in use or intended for use in Section 10.4 have no meaning in this context. But I mean, you, you, the, the context, I mean, we have to construe the statute in, on, on a basis that is, is a proper construction, whatever the context. I mean, obviously, it's relevant to know when the statute is going to become applicable. But the words in use or intended use can't mean completely different things for the cargo and the ship. No. I mean, they, they might mean different things in Section 13. We'll see. But they certainly can't mean the same things uh, applicable to the ship and the cargo. And it, it, I, I mean, to say that you ask the question whether it's in use in 2017 by reference to whether it was in use in, 20, in, in 1942 does seem to me to be a little difficult to understand. And, and just saying that the statute requires you to treat it in some uh, false and inappropriate way strikes me also as difficult to understand. I, I, I mean, this case has got off to some quite a few bad starts, really. Speaking for myself for a moment, yes, I, I, I just need to understand why this concession, well, on what basis the concession was made. Was it a, a tactical concession, or is it something you, you stand by? And if so, because it, it really makes it difficult to construe the words use or intended use if they don't mean um, use or intended use at the relevant time. It makes it very difficult to understand what the statute is saying if, if you can make that concession. Me, speaking only for myself. <laughs> well, the trouble is you don't want the... Um, you don't want the unpalatable consequences of it not being in use, do you? I mean, that's what this is all about. It's a tactical concession, as it says. Because if it's not in use, you could never get salvage. And in fact, nobody could get salvage in this situation. It's got to be in use by somebody. But then, if my lady's right, then it comes back to the question I asked this morning by whom? Mm. Because we already know that in use by, as regards the ship, is said to mean by the ship owner, and in use as regards the cargo is said to be by the cargo yes. owner, and not by anybody else. So why is that? But you, you may say, well, it, it's not exactly the same use as it was previously. But the ship owner, the non-sovereign ship owner, is still using the vessel once salvage arises because the vessel is at that stage being used as a small v vessel, i.e. container, within which the cargo is housed or something of that nature. But saying it's the same use for the same purposes as in 1942 yeah. does seem to me Perhaps the better way of, of approaching it is this. Um, the requirement of the Act is in use or intended for use in commercial purposes. Yeah. As my Lord has said, the um, precise purpose, whether it's carrying the cargo or being a repository for the cargo after it's been on the bottom of the sea for however many years, um, may not matter. I, I should make one point, because I wouldn't want to mislead, the ship was originally owned by a commercial entity. She was insured through an insurance scheme during the war, which means that I think it's common ground that she is now the property of Her Majesty's government. So when she became the property of the UK government rather than of her former owners, I can't help my lords on at this moment. I'm sure we find out. When we can infer that it was during, during the war. During the war, sometime when the insurance proceeds were, were, were paid. Um, but um, <laughs> we accepted, and, and it, 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 it may be, uh, and if it is, then it, it, it's my error, it may be that I should not have accepted um, 
in fairness to my learned friend, I think it would be unfair if I sought to exile from that, even if it was unfounded. But we're, but we're, we're not interested in the concession. Yeah. We're interested in correctly construing the legislation for this case and other cases. Uh, this is a case on very unusual facts, uh, as we've ascertained. And we love the facts. But we need to make sure, since these cases don't come to this court very often, that we don't decide the case on concessions that may turn out to look um, inappropriate later when other facts arise. When considering the, whether the ship is in use or intended for use in 20 years. So you need to keep when, your voice I, up. I do apologise. When considering whether the ship is in use or intended for use in 2017, for the purposes of the restrictive theory as applied by Section 10.4 of the Act, we have accepted that it is appropriate to have regard to the commercial use of the ship in 1942. So why is it therefore not appropriate to have regard to the commercial use in 1942 when you come to the cargo? Because, but firstly, um, it was not in use in 1942. No, that's not an answer. No, my, my the answer to the factual question can't answer the legal question. If it is appropriate, you know uh, my lord, because in order to the answer to the question of what the use was in 1942 depended on looking at two contracts which had been entirely performed in 1942 and whose relevance is de minimis we submit compared to the intention for future use in yeah, but 1942. all that's something to do with the facts of this case. I'm concerned with the question of the meaning of the words in use or intended use for commercial purposes at the relevant time, right? I know, yes. And uh, I don't think you understand the question. It cannot be that to answer that question, it is relevant to have regard to what happened when the ship sunk in regard to the ship, but not the cargo. So you, you, you can't have it both ways. <coughs> You've got to have it one way, um, logically. I mean, maybe you do want it both ways, in which case you have to tell me why. <laughs> I mean, this is a quite difficult case. My, my lord. <laughs> I, I, in terms of why we, we make the concession, which is the, the root of my, my lord's point, and I understand the, the consequence of that legally. Mm. Whether I'm right or wrong, I can only explain to the court why we perceive that to be the reason. And the reason is this. In 1942, you have an actual use for the vessel. She is doing something. Yes. In 1942, you do not have an actual use for the cargo. You have, if I can put it this way, a presumptive use, a use that the judge has deduced for the purposes of Section 10 from the antecedent history. We would accept that where there is an actual use, that may influence the decision as to actual use in 2017. But our point is that the difference is that for the cargo, you've, I, I've used the word presumptive use. I hope, my lord, I, I, I explain. You have a, only a presumptive use for the cargo. You've an assumed use, and a, a use for the purposes of section 10, which is not its actual use. Because underlying all of this is we don't accept that there was an actual use in 1942. No, uh, that, but <laughs> we, we only get to round three, essentially. Um, which is lovely to all of I suppose to say. Um, if the judge is right on, on, on the subject matter of your, your round one. In, indeed. And, and you, 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 you might say, well, if you're looking at use in 2017, whether it's use of the vessel or use of the cargo, it's legitimate to consider what the use was at a prior stage and to ask whether that has changed, which is what the judge did, essentially. But on the facts of this case, even if you're wrong about use of the cargo 
1942, uh, if the use of the cargo in 1942 was in order to be carried pursuant to the FOB and contracts of carriage, that certainly couldn't be said to be what its use was when it was sitting at the bottom of the sea in 2016 and 2017 on the facts, you may say that, and that doesn't affect the principle. Then you go back to the question, well, what about the, the use of the ship? And you may say, well, uh, it, it's perfectly legitimate to say the use of the ship by the non-sovereign ship owner in 2017 is something which it can, it can be informed by what the use of the ship was at an earlier stage if that use hasn't changed. I see all of that as, a, as, as perfectly logical, anyway, and, uh, and understandable. But we still, we still get back to the question, why do you say that the use of the ship hasn't changed between 1942 and, and 2017? Because Unless it's simply being used as a repository for the cargo throughout. Well, in 1942, it happens to be something upon which the cargo is. And in 1917, it's still something upon which the cargo was, albeit that in one in the one scenario it's, it's on top of the sea, and in the other scenario it's at the bottom. Well, m my lady, in many senses, that underlies where the concession came from, because... Yeah. In argument with the judge, he was postulating exactly that point. If you have a ship that is still afloat and susceptible to salvage services, why should it matter if she sinks? Mm. And if she sinks, and that doesn't matter, why should it matter if she sinks and she's there for 10, 20, 30, how many years? And it, it is that. Um, mm. uh, and I, th I think my Lord, Lord Justice Povell has encapsulated what I was trying to say, but more elegantly than I put it. Um, if the use, the actual use in 1942 can colour the court's consideration of whether there is a use in 2017, because there was an actual use, which at least in part is ongoing. Whereas for the cargo, the decision that the, you treat it as a use because of the contract of sale and the contract of carriage, even though it isn't actually in use, that cannot carry forward into 2017. So that is why we differentiate between the cargo and the ship. But on that analysis, is the cargo not uh, equally remaining in use as something for which the ship is being used as a repository? But it is not associated with the contract of carriage any longer, is the only answer that I can give to that problem. Because the contract of carriage has been completely performed by uh, my client. But I, I don't think anybody is saying that the use or intended use in 1942 is determinative of the issue in 2017. So the point is that if one has to identify a use for the ship in 2017, it is legitimate to look at the actual use in 1942 we say that it is different in relation to the cargo. And that is why we don't say that anything I've conceded in relation to the ship affects the position in relation to the cargo. Um, and my lords, I should perhaps have looked down at my notes during that debate, because one of the points Lord Wilberforce made in the uh, Premier Congresso case is that it can be an oversimplification when you're considering the status of the sovereign government to say once a trader, always a trader, is the phrase that you use. So when you're looking at the status of the ship, a merchant ship, you're not making that value judgment on the activity of the state. Whereas if you are looking at the activity of the state for the purposes of the restrictive period, you are making the judgment as to whether they are trade or not. Well, I think even the judge accepted that. He, 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 he said if, if there'd been a decision on change of use, then, then that would have affected it. 
but there was no decision in this case. And that's then where we come back to the dormant bank account case, that if you're doing nothing with an asset, it is simply an asset that belongs to the state to be used by the state as it sees fit in the discharge of its sovereign functions. And that's why there is the distinction between the borrower's account in the case where the bank accounts were held to be susceptible to the jurisdiction and the other accounts that were dormant in the cases where they were held not to be so. My Lords, if I may, may I move briefly on to, to grounds four and five, because uh, as it's been pointed out, if we're right on ground one, ground three um, doesn't really matter. Um, if we're wrong on ground one, we still submit that the use in 1942 doesn't sufficiently cover the uh, use or intended use for 2017. Um, I, I can't make the point any better than I've made it previously. My Lords, ground four. Um, the judge correctly identified that customary international law provides for the restricted PSMT. And the claimant um, conceded that it must be for national legislatures and courts to decide where that line uh, was drawn. Uh, but the learned judge, we respectfully suggest, fell into error in failing to have regard to the evidence which I've shown the, the court this morning of other jurisdictions, which clearly indicated, we say, that our construction of Section 10.4 is consistent with the general approach. So we don't say, as I said immediately after the lunch in German, that there is a rule of customary international law over and above the restricted theory. But what we do submit, as I said this morning, is that insofar as it is available material from other jurisdictions, including the United Nations Convention, that is all consistent with the construction that we place upon Section 10.4, which is that you need to look at the date the clause of action accrued consider whether the use is in use, sorry, the property is in use or intended for use for commercial purposes, and that if it's not in use at all, it is treated as being sovereign property. Provided English law applies the restricted uh, doctrine, it complies with customary international law. So when the judge um, asked himself at paragraph 164 whether a state might expect to be immune from certain claims, we would suggest the correct analysis is that set out in the um, Germany and Italy case at tab 23 of the authorities bundle. significance is to be found in the judgments of national courts faced with the question of whether a foreign state is immune. The legislation of those states which have enacted statutes deemed with immunity claims to immunity advanced by states before foreign courts and the statements made by states. And then um, at the bottom of that paragraph, that practice shows um, that whether in claiming immunity for themselves or according it to others, states generally proceed on the basis that there is a right to immunity under international law together with a corresponding obligation on the part of other states to give respect to that immunity. So insofar as the judge considered what the expectation of a state would be, the state would generally expect to be provided with immunity, provided that was in accordance with the restrictive theory. And this brings us back to the same point I made this morning, that provided section 10 draws the line, um, in the, it might draw it in a slightly separate place to other national legislation, but provided it draws the line in a place that reflects the restrictive theory, there is no interference with customary international law or no failure to comply with it. We say that English law, section 10, directly applies, as I submitted this morning, <coughs> the restrictive theory simply because, and by definition of the fact that it requires the court to make the inquiry into whether the property is in use or in use for 
in use or intended for use in uh, commercial purposes. And we say that our construction is supported by, um, I think, the only two decisions that the court has in the bundle that we refer to, which were the two United States um, decisions, decisions involving United States ships at tabs uh, 38 and 39 of the authorities bundle. Um, we've um, referred to these briefly, and I will take them very briefly if I may, if it is necessary to look at them. These are both cases which we say support um, our construction of uh, section 10. So at um, tab 39, um, the Spanish uh, Provincial Court, State Marine Corporation against the United States of America. Um, this was a case where military supplies were attached to secure a claim, and the claim arose under commercial contracts made for their carriage. Held by uh, the Spanish court that the attachment was annulled on the grounds that the uh, goods were immune. And that was because they were not in use, they were en route to their final destination, but the intended use um, was enough. So even though the goods were being carried pursuant to commercial contracts of carriage, the intended use was sufficient to establish immunity. And you see that from page 825, where the, uh, the sidelining is the paragraph we have established the above. So we have goods in transit, no actual use. Having established the above, the court must now refer, this is perhaps a fundamental question at issue to the nature of the goods concerned in order to determine whether or not they're covered by immunity. In this respect, the court must conclude, as already intimated, that the goods deposited enjoy the privilege of immunity from execution on account of being military goods, as appears from the maritime transport agreement. So, carried pursuant to a commercial contract, not actually in use, but entitled to immunity. And a broadly similar result in, in the other case we rely on, the United States against Eames Harbour, that's tab 38. This was a claim against the ship rather than against the cargo. But in this case, the United States state ship was at Eames Harbour pursuant to a commercial contract on the terms of the Port Authority's terms. Um, some tubes, I think boiler tubes, fell overboard and the Port Authority involved costs salving those tubes. And the ship also broke free of her moorings and caused damage in the port. And the Port Authority incurred costs in that respect as well. So actually two classic cases against the ship of, of a maritime Lien claim. But held that the ship was entitled to immunity because she was being used for the performance of a typical government function. And the nature of the event that gave rise to the claim was irrelevant. And that's at page 819, um, starting perhaps at 818. The Court of Appeal decided in paragraph 10 of its judgment that the wrongful act allegedly committed while the Queen uh, Kate Mary was at Eames Harbour must be assessed in the context of the contract in respect to the mooring agreement. So that the Court of Appeal looked at the commercial contract and that the act of making mooring arrangements in a foreign harbour was in the nature not of an act that can be considered a sovereign act, since it cannot be viewed as a conduct that is characteristic of conduct by the government capacity. And then um, in answering the question, the court then, um, in the penultimate paragraph in this page, the answer to the question is yes, uh, uh, and the crucial bit is the last sentence, the nature of the act or occurrence that gave rise to the claim is irrelevant. So the Court of Appeal proceeded on the basis that the commercial contract gave rise to the claim and on appeal, therefrom, held that was irrelevant. So both of the international cases that we rely on support, we say, the construction we rely on. So as I said earlier, uh, we don't submit that there's a um, rule of international law, apart from the uh, restrictive theory, but nonetheless, insofar as there is any practice, it supports the construction that we contend for of Section 10.4. Um, finally, ground five, the judge erred in concluding that granting immunity to the government in respect of a claim would be surprising or difficult to reconcile with the restrictive theory because, and again, this is a similar point to the one I looked at earlier, so I won't trouble for too long, because the government had, quote, exposed itself to a liability and salvage by reason of having chosen to have its property carried by sea, meaning there was nothing unfair in the state being bound to pay for such services. Um, the relevant paragraphs of the judgment are at 9, 155, 157, and 161 
and they do go just a little bit further than the paragraph that my lady and I looked at earlier. So at paragraph 9, um, the judge says that the stance we took was one which was surprised him, um, and that's in the context of what um, Sir Robert Fillmore said in the Constitution. At paragraph 155, that's in the context of section 239. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. He's, he's saying we haven't got to the section 239 point yet, but I'm, I'm a little surprised if that is the consequence of section 239. I don't by, by the way, I, I see the point. Perhaps a different point. But then 155. It would be surprising if a state which, like any private entities, enters in such contracts were immune from actions in REM in respect to um, parliament, in respect of salvage. Again, that, that's my, my lady's point that he has in mind the background of the commercial contract. It would be difficult to reconcile such a conclusion with the restricted theory of state immunity against the background of which the SIA had to be interpreted. 157, where a state contracts for its goods to be carried by see a classic example of a commercial contract. There's no reason why, pursuant to restrictive theory, it should not be exposed to the same liability. And then 161, I think, was the paragraph we looked at um, earlier. Um, and again, I, I, I'm not going to trouble for long because I made most of these submissions in the context of the other ground. But this hearing is not um, concerned uh, with whether we're liable to pay salvage. This hearing is concerned whether we're susceptible to the jurisdiction of the court on the claim against the cargo. Um, it's uh, concerned with which court will decide um, that question as to the amount of uh, salvage payable, if any. Um, as I've already submitted, the claim to immunity is not um, a matter of discretion. Um, and what the passages show that we've just looked at um, is with respect that the judge appears to be construing uh, in section 10.4, appears to have allowed himself by, to have been swayed by what he considers to be the fair outcome, as opposed to what he considers would be the surprising outcome. And we say that is wrong in the context of the restrictive theory that requires only a consideration of whether we are engaged in a commercial activity or sovereign activity. I think the other points I wanted to make in relation to that ground I have already made in the context of my earlier submissions. So, um, my lords, the points I was going to make in relation to the respondent's notice, um, I've been ticking off as I've been going along, and I've actually made, I think, all of them in the course of my submission. So although I said I would deal with the respondents' notice, I'm not in fact going to do so because I would simply be... You dealing have an opportunity to come back to them. It, it, indeed, but I don't think anything separate arises. I said most of what I was going to say was that we agree a lot of what is in the respondents' notice. So I, I'm not going to trouble further. So just by way of conclusion, in 2017, when the cause of action arose, the silver was not in use. In 2017, when the cause of action accrued, the Republic had not formed any intention as to the use of the silver. The silver cannot, therefore, have been in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. And that, in our submission, is an end of the matter. But if it is necessary to go further into 1942, given the wording in the Act, its ordinary and natural meaning, the silver was neither in use nor intended for use for commercial purposes, even though it was being carried pursuant to a commercial contract and had been purchased pursuant to a commercial contract. My Lord, I've run slightly less than I had hoped, so for which I apologise to my learned friend. Um, but uh, those are our submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mr. Hoffman. <coughs> May it please your Lordships and your Ladyship, if I may just have a moment to rearrange my deck. Almost great. <laughs> you don't rearrange it three and a half kilometres under the water. No. It's better to avoid that. <coughs> Submissions will be structured in the following way, if I may. I will begin with a short scene-setting introduction. Uh, I will then make general submissions on the public international law principle of restrictive immunity. 
uh, and its reception into the United Kingdom and under English law. Uh, thereafter, I will address what I consider to be the two primary issues which arise on the appeal. Uh, they are both issues of law or the application uh, of the law to the facts as found by the judge. The judge's findings of fact are not, uh, not under appeal, uh, nor are you being asked to make additional findings of fact. A and the two issues are, are, are these. First, what is the true meaning of the phrase in use for commercial purposes, where it appears in section 10.4a of the State of Indiana, 1978. That's the first issue. Second, was the cargo, using that terminology, in use for commercial purposes at the time when the cause of action arose? And that is, of course, the relevant point of time for the purposes of section 10 of the State Immunity Act. It is not the relevant point in time for the purposes of section 13 uh, of the State Immunity Act. The relevant time for the purposes of section 13 is for the time being. Uh, the distinction is not without significance, and I'll explain that in due course, and it's perhaps also important to recognise that when the application was made, it was made under section 13, and it was only subsequently changed to an application uh, under section 10, and it's not difficult to uh, appreciate why that change was made, uh, because at that point, uh, the, if one was looking at the position for the time being, then the Republic of South Africa were in Scene set in introduction, if I may, and it is it is just important to be aware of the background uh, situation. The Salvo has solved what was the Republic of South Africa's silver at substantial expense and having applied considerable effort. The Re Republic does not deny that the silver has been solved, or that subject to its two defences, the salvo is in principle entitled to salvage, and the judge records that in, in his judgment. I, I, instead, the Republic is now seeking to get out of the obligation to pay salvage, relying on state immunity. The Republic's contractual counterparty, Odyssey, wants the silver in order to sell it commercially. And the Republic wants a small part of the proceeds of the silver, but neither wants to pay this for the silver's recovery. Not, not an attraction, attractive position for either the Republic or Odyssey to adopt. The uh, uh, you've lost me slightly. What, what's the significance of Odyssey's present position? Because Od Odyssey has a commercial contract with the Republic. Cargo. To solve the cargo, but, but it's a it's a it's a very different type of contract, uh, in that uh, it, it is uh, if the republic is um, succeeds in its immunity claim, Odyssey will get eighty five percent under its contract of, of the value of the silver, and not the republic. And that's the way in which the contract was changed. At a late stage, by Odyssey, but, but I, don't understand. I don't understand Odyssey's role, I'm afraid. But Odyssey were, were Odyssey involved in solving the cargo? O o Odyssey were involved in negotiations with the Republic. That I understand, but presumably the contract provided that they get their 85 percent if they sell the cargo. No? Uh, but it was changed so that so long as the Republic recover the cargo, o Odyssey gets 85 percent of it. But, but, but uh, I see that. As a matter of fact, yeah. why does it have any bearing on the legal questions you identify? Um, the, 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 the bearing it has on the legal facts that I've identified uh, is that if one's looking at the position uh, 
in the period 2017 and, and thereafter, th then what one has to see precisely what's going on. Who is the party that is... We're dealing with state immunity. Well, we're dealing with state immunity, but, and we're dealing with law, but we're yes. not dealing with merits, as I think you accept what no. Mr. Smith said. This is not a discretion in the court. We have to interpret the legislation and apply it to the facts, full stop. So, so the fact that it may be all a terrible swizz, I can put it that way, um, is neither here nor there, is it? I mean, that sometimes cases are like that, Mr. Hoffman. That is, that is absolutely right. Your Lordship is right. Mm -hmm. but, but one of the uh, consequences, we say, of that, uh, there is, I, I, in the Section 13 cases, one gets a certificate from the state mm -hmm. in relation to the use. Well, there's no certificate in this case. And the Odyssey involvement explains precisely why there is no certificate I, I, in this case. But we haven't got to the execution stage yet. No, we haven't got to the execution yeah. stage. But, but uh, um, what we are what we are saying is that if you look, we, we're painting the picture in order to be able to show that. If you look at the factual matrix, we don't actually see a single sovereign act done by the Republic of South Africa. If a commercial actor was seeking to purchase the silver at the time and have it shipped from India to South Africa, it would have done exactly the same thing. And when we come to look at the analysis in Premier Congresso del Partido, the significance of the point will be made. But let, I, I hear what your Lordship and your Ladyship are saying, and I will, I will move on quickly. They don't have to do a sovereign act. It's really got nothing to do with sovereign act. It's a question of whether it can be shown uh, that it, the, it is in, in use or intended use for commercial purposes. Well, is the, is the point you're sort of struggling to make, Mr. Hoffmeyer, that if one was to look at it as at today or as at post-2017, uh, any intention as to its use form, formed by the Republic um, is a commercial use because they intend to use it to pay 85% to uh, Odyssey for doing nothing uh, and 15, keep 15% 15 for themselves. Because they entered into a contract mm. in respect of the cargo, uh, which um, if the test was for the time being, yeah. uh, then it would be in use um, uh, for the purposes of um, the, the Sovereign Immunity Act. Well, speaking for myself, I'm not sure that's something, even if it were relevant, take into account since there's no finding by the judge of that mm -hmm. and we don't have the evidence on which it's based. No, no. So you tell us. Well, well, Sounds uh, like a merit no, the, point, the, Mr. The, Hoffman. The, 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 the evidence upon which it's based is set out in the judgment um, in dealing with Odyssey's involvement. What, did, or, or did Odyssey get the 85% of the cargo now? Uh, That's in the judgment? He, 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 I don't think he made a finding of fact to that effect. No, no. Okay. But it doesn't matter. No, no, what it matters is, is what happened. What, what the answer to the test is at the relevant time, which is either June or October 2017, end of story, I regret to say. I mean, you know, we're a court of law, uh, Mr. Hoffmeyer, not a, not a court of merits. My, my Lord, let me move on to the second topic that I was going to address, which is the concept of restrictive yes. immunity. I mean, because because one of the criticisms which Mr. Smith did not address to the judge, but it could be addressed, and he probably didn't address it because courts don't like this kind of argument any more than they like the one that you've just addressed, which is that the judge tried a bit too hard here to, to find with the merits. And um, as he saw them, he made it perfectly clear where he thought the merits were. That, that, that is certainly a criticism which may um, be leveled at him, and it may uh, ultimately, uh, if uh, you you. Lordships come to the conclusion that his uh, interpretation of the statute was, was wrong, then you will have s come to that conclusion that he's wrong. Is wrong. Yes. yes. But I mean, the point I'm, I'm urging you is to tell us exactly why, as a matter of law, he was right without the overlay of on the merits, it was a good thing to decide like that. I, I, I will do so, and I, in order to make good those submissions, 
uh, I need to make submissions first in relation to the restrictive theory. Of course, uh, yes, on you get. Um, foreign state or sovereign immunity is a principle of um, <clears throat> public international law, the rationale of which is that states are sovereign equals who should not be subjected to the jurisdiction of each other's courts. A judge cannot judge another state. And the only situation in which a foreign state evokes immunity from adjudicative jurisdiction is when it is sued in the courts of another country, the forum state. A foreign state claims immunity from the adjudicative, adjudicatory jurisdiction of the forum state on the basis that the forum has no power to adjudicate a matter in which a foreign state is named as defendant. A and a foreign state may invoke immunity from enforcement jurisdiction, both where the assistance of the courts of the forum country is invoked to effect enforcement, and when state-owned goods are seized, it, not by the courts, by police on suspicion of, of being proceeds of crime, uh, etc. So there is a, a, a distinction between uh, the claim to immunity at the judicatory stage uh, and the claim to immunity at the enforcement stage. And until about the middle of the 20th century, foreign state immunity was absolute in nature, which meant that a foreign state could never be sued in another country's courts. A and while some countries, such as China, still follow the practice of absolute immunity, nearly all nation states began adopting the principle of uh, restrictive immunity from before the Second World War. Uh, the common law countries, including uh, England, uh, more slowly than others in adopting uh, the principle. A and according to the restrictive doctrine, a foreign state can generally only claim immunity from adjudication where it has engaged in sovereign as opposed to commercial activity. The rationale for the restrictive view is that where a state engages in international trade and commerce in a manner akin to a private entity, then it should receive equivalent procedural treatment in litigation. Accordingly, today, in countries such as Australia, United Kingdom, United States, a, a foreign state is not immune in disputes concerning commercial transactions or commercial activity performed by the state. And I use those words transactions and activity uh, purposefully because those are the words that are picked up in Section 3.3 uh, of, of the Act. In England, it happened in this way. The courts came to appreciate that customary international law required that only restrictive immunity be granted to foreign states. And on that basis, the common law, the English courts, identified the parameters of the doctrine and incorporated it into the common law. At the outset, it is important to point out that the authorities to which I will refer concern immunity from the adjudicative jurisdiction of the courts. The dynamic as it pertains to the enforcement jurisdiction, that is the immunity that state-owned property enjoys from arrest or seizure, uh, is different. A and perhaps if I can invite your lordships to turn uh, at this point, to uh, the judgment, the, the decision of the Supreme Court in Benkar, which that is uh, divide uh, 17 in the bundle, page 350 uh, of the electronic version uh, of the text. Uh, and in Benkar, uh, <coughs> Paragraph A, Lord Sumption sets out the distinction between the 
two immunities, uh, and it's important to note, as at common law, he's dealing with the common law here, uh, and he says at paragraph 8, before 1978, state immunity was governed in the United Kingdom by the common law. Properly speaking, it comprised two immunities whose boundaries were not necessarily the same. An immunity from the adjudicative jurisdiction of the courts of the forum uh, and a distinct immunity from process against its property uh, in the forum state. That is, in other words, uh, immunity from the enforcement. Uh, and the development uh, of the common law uh, is then sum summarized uh, by Lord Sunshine in, in the section uh, which follows his quotation from the Christina at the top of page 369 uh, of uh, the bundle uh, in paragraph 8. By 1978, however, the position at common law had changed as a result of the decisions of the Privy Council in the Philippine Admiral and the Court of Appeal in Trenton. These decisions marked the adoption by the common law of the restrictive doctrine of sovereign immunity already accepted by the United States and much of Europe. The restrictive doctrine recognized state immunity only in respect of acts done by the state in the exercise of sovereign authority, jure imperii, as opposed to acts of private law nature, jure gestionis. Moreover, and importantly, the classification of the relevant act was taken to depend on its juridical character and not the state's purpose in doing it save in cases where the purpose threw light on its jur juridical character. Uh, and he then cross-refers to Premier Congresso decision. Um, time won't permit me, really, in, in relation to this, but if I had time, I would be tempted at this point to spend a short while looking at the judgments in trend text um, because they show that development but I, I, I don't think I need to do so because they're picked up hopefully sufficiently in Ben Carbouche uh, uh, for, for present purposes uh, and so let me continue um, no sorry let me turn directly to Premier Congresso uh, which is the case to which um, Lord Sumption referred at the end of paragraph 8 uh, and the uh, that decision is to be found at divide 9 in the bundle, page 176 of the, um, the uh, electronic version of the um, bundle. Now, the facts of the case are complicated, and, I, and forgive me if I uh, summarize them uh, in a way which leaves out some of the necessary detail, uh, but it involved Cuba's conduct with respect to two trading vessels, the Player Lager and the Marble Islands. But the short point is that Cuba, by its actions with respect to the Player Lager in particular, had caused a contract for the delivery of a cargo of sugar to be breached by a state-owned trading company, Mambisa, for foreign policy reasons. It, it didn't approve of the removal of the Allende government in Chile. A, a, and this is the case in, in which Lord Wilberforce gave the definitive statement about the scope and principles of restrictive immunity at common law. A, a, and we started, if I may, at page 192. It's page 260 of the uh, report. Uh, where uh, Lord Wilberforce sets out the law, uh, uh, as you can see from his heading at the top of the page, uh, uh, and we can start at, uh, with the point at, at D to E. An interesting starting point is on the irrelevance of statutes to the content of customary international law. And at D to E he states, uh, beginning of D, if one state chooses to lay down by enactment certain limits, that is by itself no evidence 
those limits are generally accepted by states. Just pausing there, that, that is obviously uh, of relevance in the context of my learned friend taking you to many other statutes from around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly enacted limits may be, or presumed to be, not inconsistent with general international law, the latter being in a state of uncertainty, without affording evidence <coughs> what that law is. Uh, and then over the page, page 193, uh, we see uh, at D and following uh, a criticism of the distinction between in rem and in personam claims drawn by the Privy Council in the Philippine Admiral. It, it, it is very much similar to the, 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 those of Lord Denning from the Court of Appeal, uh, and he says this, Sitting in this house, I would unhesitatingly affirm, as part of English law, the advance made by the Philippine Admiral, <coughs> with the reservation that the decision was perhaps unnecessarily restrictive in apparently confining the departure made to actions in REM. In truth, an action in REM as regards a ship, if it proceeds beyond the initial stages, is itself, in addition, an action in persona. Uh, see the owner of the ship, the Christina, sorry, namely, um, the, the description in REM denoting the procedural advantages available as regards service, arrest, and enforcement. It should be borne in mind that no distinction between actions in REM and actions in personam is generally recognized elsewhere, so that it would in any event be desirable to liberate English law from an anomaly if that existed. In fact, there's no anomaly and no distinction. The effect of the, the Philippine admirable, if accepted, as I would accept it, is that as regards state-owned trading vessels, actions, whether commenced in REM or not, are to be decided according to the restrictive theory. And then over the following page, 194. What, uh, what, what you get out of this, because we do know that Section 10 does draw a distinction between actions in REM actions in personam with different criteria which have to be fulfilled for your community as between A and, and, and B. The, 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 that, that, is, that, is, that is absolutely right uh, in the statute, uh, but we will come to say, we will say that uh, insofar as uh, one is able to read them in a way which creates the minimal distinctions, that, that is the appropriate uh, approach to the issue of construction. And then on the following page, 194, beginning at, <coughs> at C, uh, we see Lord Wilberforce setting out the principal basis uh, for restrictive immunity. It, it is necessary to start from first principle, the basis upon which one state is considered to be immune from the territorial jurisdiction of the courts of another state is that of power <coughs> in pari, which effectively means that the sovereign or governmental acts of one state are not matters upon which the courts of other states will adjudicate. The relevant exception or limitation which has been engrafted upon the principle of the immunity of states under the so-called restrictive theory arises from the willingness of states to enter into commercial or other private law transactions with individuals. It appears to have two main foundations. A, it is necessary in the interest of justice to individuals having such transactions with states to allow them to bring such transactions before the court and B, to require a state to answer a claim based upon such transactions does not involve a challenge to or inquiry into any act of sovereignty or government act of that state. It is, in accepted phrases, neither a threat to the dignity of that state nor any interference uh, with its sovereign functions. Uh, so to rephrase, we have two basic rationales uh, for the doctrine. First, the interests of justice require that those who enter into commercial transactions with states are able to bring claims against them. And second, that claims of this nature do not threaten the dignity of the state nor its sovereign functions. And then immediately below, we see the test for the dividing line between the two categories. When Therefore, a claim is brought 
against the state, and state immunity is claimed, it is necessary to consider what is the relevant act which forms the basis of the claim. Is this, under the old terminology, an act jure gestionis, or is it an act jure imperium? Is it a private act, or is it a sovereign or public act? A private act meaning, in this context, an act of a private law character, such as a private person, private citizen, might have entered into. Now, uh, running ahead of myself for a moment, so when a state behaves in a way that one might expect a private person to behave, say by putting a cargo purchased commercially on board a commercial trading vessel pursuant to a commercial contract of carriage and then having the benefit uh, of commercial salvage, they should not expect to have the benefit of state immunity which by its nature attaches only to sovereign acts. Well, that begs the question, which is, which is perhaps the nub of this, is what is the act Correct. That, and that we're talking about? If, if, if you, were, um, you could bring yourself within section three, and your claim was in relation to all that activity you've been describing, then there would be no immunity. Uh, but uh, I think what's said on, on, on behalf of South Africa is the act is merely ownership of the cargo, uh, and that is uh, a sovereign in the sense that, in this case, it's a cargo which is for a sovereign purpose, a sovereign cargo in the same way as a, a military equipment would be. I understand that, and I've come to address that, because it involves, it requires one very carefully to read the language of section 10.4a together with the language of section 3.3 and in particular section 33C, uh, but I'll come to that and, and unpack that, if I may, tomorrow. Uh, uh, and then uh, at page 195, and this is also significant, Lord Wilberforce turns uh, to the phrase coined by Lord Denning in the Court of Appeal, once a trader, always a trader, and sets out a vital qualification uh, which is worth investigating, uh, and we start uh, at um, just just ahead above C on page 195, an assertion once a trader, uh, always a trader, may be an oversimplification, just reading down, uh, may be an oversimplification. If a trader is always a trader, the state remains a, a, a state and is capable at any time of acts of sovereignty. The question arises, therefore, what is the position where the act upon which the claim is founded is quite outside the commercial or private law activity in which the state is engaged and has the character of an act done jure imperium? The restrictive theory does not and could not deny capability of a state to resort to sovereign or governmental action. It merely asserts that acts done within the trading or commercial activity are not immune. The inquiry still has to be made whether there were within or outside that activity. And then we see a comment on commercial obligations in the context of shipping law and the international sale of goods. In, that's a D to E. In many cases, the process of deciding upon the character of the relevant act presents no difficulty. In the Philippine Admiral, once it was accepted that the contract, uh, for the contract for goods, the obligations to repay disbursements, and the charter party were of a trading or commercial character, the breach of these obligations was clearly within the same area, nonetheless because, nonetheless, because committed by a state. Other reported cases are of the same character, and reference is made to the chart here, which is a collision case, the Port of Alexandria, which is a salvage case, in cases which would have been decided the other way. Sorry, uh, yes. In Trentex, and sorry, I'm picking up again, similarly, and the same is true of the acts in issue in other countries relating to the Nigerian cement purchase 
the relevant act was simply a breach of a commercial contract and was treated as such, nonetheless, though committed by a state or department of state for reasons of government. The purpose for which the breach was committed could not alter its clear character. So we see that Lord Wilberforce here is looking at the acts inherent in the particular factual matrix. Where there is an absence of sovereign act, he considers the matter to be essentially commercial, such that the state is not entitled to immunity. And we see that confirmed if we then turn on to page 199. Just below B, the conclusion which emerges is that in considering under the restrictive theory whether state immunity should be granted or not, the court must consider the whole context in which the claim against the state is made with a view to deciding whether the relevant acts upon which the claim is based should, in that context, be considered as fairly within the area of activity, trading or commercial, or otherwise of a private law character in which the state has chosen to engage, or whether the relevant act or acts should be considered as having been done outside that area and in the area, in the sphere of governmental or sovereign activity. And we can then see how he applies this lower on the page to the player Lager at G to H. Whether the Republic of Cuba can claim immunity depends, if I'm right, as to the law upon an examination of those acts in respect of which the claim is asserted. The appellants are certainly able to show as a starting point that this vessel was engaged in trade with the consent, if not with the active participation of the Republic of Cuba. They were doing business with a foreign government to use the victory transport formulation. The question is whether the acts which gave rise to an alleged cause of action were done in the context of the trading relationship or were done by the government of the Republic of Cuba acting wholly outside the trading relationship and in exercise of the power of the state. Then continuing, in my opinion, it must be answered on a broad view of the facts as a whole and not upon narrow issues as to Cuba's possible contractual liability. And then he continues. I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but just pausing there and focusing on that passage. The acts in respect of which the claim is asserted and the acts which gave rise to an alleged cause of action. In this case, the acts of the government, which is necessary for you to plead in order to claim salvage, are they any more than simply that the government is the owner of the cargo? Put another way, would the circumstances in which the cargo was put on board form any relevant development for the purposes of the claim or the cause of action? We say they do. The cause of action in salvage? Sorry? For the cause of action in salvage? For the cause of action in salvage, we would... The cause of action in salvage is brought against the silver itself. But if it were an in persona claim? Now, if we were into an in persona claim, then if the Republic claims to be the owner of the cargo as they've done, then we would say in that capacity they're liable to pay us the salvage. Right. And therefore, for the purposes of the salvage claim, the circumstances in which they became the owner or the circumstances in which the cargo came to be on board the vessel wouldn't be material developments for your cause of action or your claim in salvage. But they would be relevant. Let's assume for the moment the cargo was being carried in the same way in 2018 and ran aground and needed 
salvage services to be performed in those circumstances, uh, then uh, the um, our claim would not simply be you are the owner of the cargo, uh, or we would say for the purposes of the um, application of the Act, what one has to look at the, the trading activity, because that is the context, and that's what Lord Wilberforce is saying, that is the context in which the claim arises. Is there, is there any, um, have they performed a sovereign act to show that this is sovereign activity, uh, or uh, ha have they not? And we say that the situation is devoid of any uh, act of sovereign activity. And, and the mere <coughs> fact of ownership is not activity uh, in, in any event. But in answer to my Lord's question, none of the contract of carriage or the way in which the um, RSA acquired ownership of the cargo is material to whether or not they have to pay salvage. Um, you don't need to believe it. Is, you we, say, you're the owner of the cargo, I've salved it, pay me the money. No, but it is relevant to the question as to whether they can claim immunity. But that, that's not the, the question he or... asked you. The, the question of the way actions work, even actions in rem, is you bring the claim, and your claim is for salvage, and then the state, if it's a sovereign state that you're suing, can say, this matter cannot be adjudicated by this court because I am entitled to sovereign immunity in respect of this claim. And that's what's happened here. And the question of whether they're entitled to sovereign immunity is answered by reference to customary international law and the Sovereign Immunity Act. Um, but the acts in respect of which you claim are the acts in respect of which you claim. The act in respect of which you claim is an act of salvage, and the act of the Republic of South Africa is the act of ownership of the silver. With respect, we say that the, the applying the uh, let, let's assume that it hasn't laid on the, on the bottom of the sea for 70 years just for purposes of testing this. the Republic of South Africa has entered into commercial transactions for the purposes of purchasing silver and having it carried to its destination uh, that is commercial activity that is trading activity and if in that context it gives rise to a claim for salvage, that context is relevant. And if it were otherwise, the Republic of South Africa would simply have immunity from any and every uh, 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 claim for salvage uh, so long as it was the owner of the cargo. Well, that is a place to leave it, and a thought which we can dwell upon overnight and resume Mr. Hofmeyer at 10.30 in the morning. Thank you. Thank you.